So welcome to the 2012 Penn State Lectures on the Frontiers of Science. My name is Barbara Kennedy. I'm the chair of the organizing committee for this lecture series, which the Penn State Everly College of Science provides as a free public mini course annually. Our theme this year is food, strategies for growing enough for everyone. Our speaker today, which is the fourth series in the 2012 lecture series, is Professor David Hughes. Dr. Hughes is an assistant professor of entomology and biology at Penn State. He has received numerous awards for his scientific achievements, some of which include a Marie Curie International Outgoing Fellowship, a Marie Curie Intra-European Fellowship, and a Varley Gradwell Traveling Fellowship in Insect Ecology. In his research program, he explores and surveys parasites that affect insects in Thailand, Colombia, Ghana, Brazil, China, Australia, and the United States. He also investigates the evolution of social insects, integrated pest management, the evolution of disease, and human behavior as it's related to disease dynamics. The title of his lecture today is Novel Solutions to Complex Diseases in Subsistence Agriculture. Let's give a warm welcome to Dr. David Hughes. Good morning, everybody, and thank you to Barbara. Um, we did a sound check earlier, so you should be all able to hear me. Is that the case? No, not at all? How about now? So the question, in addition, is whether you can hear me, is whether you can actually understand me. My, I've been doing a poll among Americans in the last week to see how thick my accent is. It is, of course, an Irish accent, um, and it shouldn't be too bad. But at some stage, I'm going to start speaking about the Irish potato famine, and then that probably will ramp up my accent somewhat. So at that point, if it gets a bit too much of an Irish brogue, please do throw a pencil at me or something like that. So everybody can hear me. Thank you. So I wanted to start my, my talk in rather an unusual way and, and give you my conclusion slide first. Because as, I, as I'm going to go through this, I'm going to have one very important message. Um, and, and I think the, these two quotations really capture that message. So the first quotation is a Spanish proverb, which is that we're really um, very close to anarchy. From civilization to anarchy, it's really just a loss of the food that we have and the food which we provide. And I think this quotation is very useful because it reinforces a couple of messages. In this seminar series in the previous years, what the faculty have been tasked with doing is trying to communicate science to the public. And it's a very important thing. And whenever you're communicating science, you or whatever you're actually taking part in doing science, you should be as dispassionate as possible. We shouldn't have our science influenced by politics or, or, or fashions or, or social mores. We should just do science in the absence of those external influences. But the science of agriculture, agricultural science, which is the foundation of Penn State's mission, that, that can never be divorced from politics. Because when you start looking about how you might improve food, you can never uh, divorce it from the societal complexity that food is always uh, 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 germane to. So I want to mention that I'm going to be speaking a lot about science, but I'm also going to be speaking about politics and history and world trade routes and the emergence of civilization. The other aspect of this quotation reinforces, for me at least, that Civilization is built upon the foundation of agricultural science. So that's something that we do very well here, and I'm going to reinforce uh, Penn State's contribution. The other um, uh, quotation is that we're, we're at this really interesting turning point where we have to feed an enormously growing population. Nina Federoff in the first lecture made this point very well. There are far too many people, and there are not enough resources. And what I'm going to say throughout the talk is that we have the solutions and we have examples from the past. We have good examples and bad examples and we can choose which ones to adopt as we move forward and try to find these solutions. So 
Um, th this slide was also just to give you a chance to get used to my accent, tune your brain into the Irish accent, and you'll see this slide in just over 60 minutes' time in case you missed it. So I have the, the, the good pleasure, the great pleasure to be involved in a number of institutes here at Penn State, the Center for Infectious Disease Dynamics and the Aberley College of Sciences, which is running this lecture series, and also the, the College of Agricultural Sciences. And there are many faculty like me who are dispersed among different locations. And I think this is one of the shining graces of Penn State that we can do that because it allows a great degree of integration. Penn State is extremely good in disease biology, and it's also extremely good in agricultural sciences. And one of the messages from the talk today is that this is what we're going to need. We're going to need people who are pumping out a lot of genomic material, doing nanotechnology, uh, understanding advances in technology, and marrying that perfectly to people who've spent their entire career looking at a particular fungus on a particular tree. And I think that's the strength that we have here, and I think that's the strength that we need. So in addition to the message of increase, increasing food security and having novel solutions, I, I also want to have the message that Penn State is particularly well placed to do that. I'm going to talk to you today about diseases, diseases of plants. Diseases of plants are really no different from diseases of animals, and uh, many of you may have seen the the series last year on the epidemiology. Um, the most important thing to understand about diseases is that they're caused by parasites. And paras the word parasite actually doesn't come from an animal. It, it comes from what the ancient Greeks used to call people. Those people who used to steal food or take food from another person's table. That's where the word comes from. And throughout this talk, I'm going to emphasize a lot of aspects of etymology where the words come from, because that's very important. Because when we think about the current problems we have, we have a population of 7 billion people. Every 13 years, we add another billion people. By 2050, it's going to be 9 billion people. All over the world, experts are saying, and Nina Fedorov made a very good uh, case on the first lecture, that we have to double food production. We know that parasites eat at our table. They take our food. The, the viral diseases, the fungal diseases, the bacterial diseases of plants, they take 40% of our food away before it ever gets to our table. And so clearly, what would be really useful is simply stopping them. The 40% value is an average all over the crops, all over different crops and all over the world. Locally, of course, it can be catastrophic subsistence farmers, people who live on very small patches of land, the same size as a football field, for example, that accounts for 75% of all poor farmers in developing countries. People with small patches of land, those guys can lose 80 or 85% of their crops to diseases. But the 40% is an average across many different crops. And obviously, if we can recover this, we can go a large way to actually ensuring food security. 7 billion is an incredibly difficult number to get your head around. Um, I like this, this, um, this piece from the, the BBC website where you can actually put in your date of birth. So I was born in 1974. So when I was born, just here, there were that many people on the planet. So in my relatively short lifetime, we've added 3 billion people. And you can go and do this. The website is there. It's on your handout. You can go and do this and see where you fit into the grand scheme. But the colossal uh, increase in population is staggering. And it's, it's so staggering that it's sometimes just difficult to, uh, to, to conceptualize it. In the 1960s, we did, of course, see that the population was increasing enormously. And a, a very famous uh, biologist who's at the University of Pennsylvania, he made a rather startling claim that in the 1970s, everything was going to go to hell. We were going to have hundreds of millions of people dying because for him and for other people besides, because he was encouraged to write this book, for him, the, the idea was that we would simply not feed them. It would be impossible. We would have mass mortality on a scale never before seen in human history. And that, of course, did not happen. 
And the reason it did not happen is due to the activities of a large number of people, but certainly the poster child of this is Norman Borlaug, a, a young farmer from Iowa. And he grew up on a farm. He, he was the, the son of Norwegian uh, immigrants, and he was all set up to go on and, and, um, and, and have a farming life. But he followed, thankfully, he followed the advice of his grandfather, who said, if you want to fill your belly, you have to fill your, your mind. And so he headed off to college. From college, he went on to be an agronomist. Um, many people describe him as a humanitarian. He won the Nobel Peace Prize in the 1970s for his work. He is largely credited with the Green Revolution. This is the reason why the catastrophic prediction of Paul Ehrlich did not come true, because we managed to feed hundreds and hundreds of millions of people. And it is not, a hyper, uh, hyper, uh, it is not an overstatement to say that he has saved the lives of two billion people, along with such other inventions such as uh, fertilizers. The essential points about the Green Revolution is that Farmers embraced technology, and by so doing, they were able to increase wheat production and rice production, um, the, a, more, uh, a more sustained use of fertilizers, crop sprayers. All of these things have made enormous benefits to the production that we see. Uh, this graph shows you an example of this just for wheat, where we can see an enormous rise. So this is the moment where Ehrlich was, 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 was giving his dire prognostications, and thankfully, it didn't come true. This point is made nicely in, in one of your handouts. From, from your handouts, you have um, a couple of documents from the Gates Foundation, which is very much involved in philanthropy, uh, particularly as it pertains to agricultural sciences. And they have this very nice schema, which they really emphasize that in, in America and also in, in Russia, you can have a very large production of wheat uh, because of the benefits of the Green Revolution. China's increasing in this. It's embracing more and more technology, large-scale farms, India less so. But the overwhelming outlier in the Green Revolution is Africa. Africa has not benefited. Everybody will, will, will admit this freely. Africa has not benefited from the Green Revolution. And the reason is, is that we cannot, there's a couple of reasons. One is we pretty much ignored Africa. We, uh, if we think about diseases that we heard about last year, uh, particularly from people like Andrew Reid and Peter Hudson, we can learn such horrible facts that we spend more on the research of curing male baldness than we do on curing malaria. So of course we have not invested in Africa. So of course that's the reason why they don't have, they haven't uh, uh, reaped the benefits of the Green Revolution. But the other reason is that a lot of countries in Africa, the people spend, um, they're involved heavily in, 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 in working on, on agri agriculture, being involved in the small plots of land they have. This doesn't lend itself very well to massive mechanization that you would see in the wheat belt of America. And so what we have to deal with is the reality that today there are one billion people across the world, many of which are in sub-Saharan Africa, going hungry because of uh, inefficient agricultural practices. So unlike in the first Green Revolution, when all we really had to do was taking ancestral forms of wheat and rice and different grains and increasing their productivity through classical breeding, increased fertilizer, better irrigation, better spraying, we just had to increase productivity by making them grow better. In, the, in Africa today, the solution is not like that. The solution requires a whole range of different approaches, which have to consider the biology, the politics, the trade. Um, and so really what people are saying is there is no single solution to increasing uh, yield in Africa. So thankfully, recognizing this fact, there has been a change where the formation of AGRA, which is the Association um, for a Green Revolution in Africa. And that's led by Africans with a whole range of uh, external uh, forces which are, which are acting as consultants and giving a great deal, degree of input. But it's taking a uniquely 
African solution for a uniquely African problem. And just as an example of this, um, bear in mind that three quarters of the world's poor raise all of the money they need, all of the food they need to send their kids to school, to, to clothe them, to buy medication, all on a patch of land no bigger than a football field. I think maybe twice the size of the average garden in State College. 80% of the work is by women, so it's a fundamentally different workforce than we've had in Western Europe where agriculture was male-driven. And in addition, another problem that they have is that even though the women do all the work, they're not the ones doing all the educational outreach. And so there's a number of important and, and unique attributes of agricultural development in Africa that people like AGRA are trying to approach, and that's very good news. AGRA is currently led by Kofi Annan, the former Secretary General of the UN. He's now the chairman of AGRA. And what Kofi Annan has said is that we're at an interesting tipping point. He really, of course, really believes that we can mobilize uh, broad swathes of people across sub-Saharan Africa, bring international philanthropy and international technology, and we can change forever the face of agriculture. He believes we're at a tipping point. But the whole thing about tipping points is you can go one way or the other. And this point was beautifully made in a book by Julian Cribbs where he talks about the coming famine. Julian is a, is a really excellent um, uh, journalist, an agricultural journalist, and he has made the point consistently in his book, which I highly recommend to you. And it's not a pessimistic point, it's a realistic one, that we, we have the opportunities here. We have the potential solutions. So, what I want to do is I want to introduce you to a range of different plant diseases. I want to give you some serious some stories which will allow you to contextualize the different uh, aspects here, such as science, such as trade, such as politics. And then I want to talk about a major problem, which is movement. We're never going to solve the problem of movement. We have been doing it for 10,000 years. We are going to continue to do it. But just recognizing the problems will be, a, will be a first step. And then I'll come back and sort of wave the flag for Penn State. At this point, can you still understand me and am I still clear? Thank you. So, so I don't actually, I do work on plant diseases. I, I have started to work on plant diseases in the last year because I, I, I think it is, it is, it is without exception the most serious problem that humanity is facing, which is, which is um, increasing food security. But what I actually work on are diseases of ants. So this is me in Thailand looking at an ant colony. These are the ants here running across, running across the canopy. This is from 60 feet up, and this is the, the view looking down. So in this system, we have a lot of ants dying on the, on the forest floor, and the nests are up here. And this is the phenomenon that I look at. It's one of many different phenomena that I look at. It's a fungus which has infected an ant, controlled its behavior, the zombie ant behavior, and then causing it to go and die in a special location in the forest. And that's all I'm going to say in it. That's my day job, okay? If you want to have a look, you can, you can go to this very wonderfully produced uh, uh, video by the science team here, by Barbara and her team. Uh, we, we did this on Mount Nittany. It's, it was it's a fun exercise. And you can go and hear about my research on, 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 the, on the ant diseases. So in doing that, as, as Barbara emphasized, I have the, had the great fortune of traveling all over the world. I have worked in 11 countries on, on five different continents. I've worked from the Arctic Circle down to the, the tropical rainforest of Northern Australia. And since it is a snowy day in State College, I thought I'd share with you some pictures. I'm not sure if that's actually going to help. Um, but this is one of the field sites in Australia. It is rainforest, beach, glorious sea. It could not get better. Um, Thailand, uh, this is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. It is extraordinarily beautiful. The Atlantic rainforest of Brazil, uh, which is just a patchwork of remnant forests uh, remaining on the Atlantic coast, also an extremely beautiful place to to, to work, and I also worked in uh, on, on Tuscan villas. The reason we're standing on a house is because we were looking for wasp nests, which are underneath the roof tiles. This is also a spectacularly nice place to work. 
And a lot of the motivation for my research for looking at these parasites in the ants is the fungus that gets inside the ant's body. The foundational work was done by Dr. Harry Evans, who is a senior research scientist at CABI in the UK. And he had described a number of species back in the 70s. He did some really cool ecology on the system. But that was his side project. His day job was working for the British government as a plant pathologist. As you know, the British government owned a lot of the world once upon a time, uh, which was not necessarily a good thing. But the good thing they did do is that they had a, a range of scientists going out to the colonies and helping control diseases. And they still do that, which is a, a really excellent thing. So Harry would, has traveled all over the world dealing with diseases in, in far-flung places from China to, 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 uh, to South America. And so what I have done over the last two years, rather remarkably, is that I've spent over 100 days with this guy. And, 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 and we worked on the ant diseases. But since he's an excellent plant pathologist, he's an essentially a walking encyclopedia I, I became infected by plant pathology. And so traveling around with him, of course, anybody can travel to the Atlantic rainforest, of, the Atlantic coast of Brazil, where once upon a time it was all rainforest. Anybody can travel there and see that it's all gone. It's all been turned over to coffee, for example. And you can see that the landscape has been fundamentally changed. And you can see that there are just these little patches. So it doesn't require uh, a rocket scientist to, to figure this out. And the sad fact of it is that this is a biodiversity hotspot, one of 32 on the planet. They're, they're chosen because of their uh, great importance. The Atlantic rainforest of Brazil, for example, has 40% endemicity in plants, which means those plants only occur there. And of course, uh, 92, 93% of those uh, have, been, ha, ha, have been exterminated because of the loss of forest. So we can all see this, and it's quite clear. And you can also see that it's not just coffee, it's such things as agro-tourism. I mean, this is a beautiful picture. It's a beautiful location where, where I took the picture from, but it's not, it's not natural, of course. The same thing for cattle. I think this is a beautiful picture. Uh, many people will, might be aghast looking at cattle in Brazil. It's quite synonymous with... Um, the, 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 the negative imprint of globalization which we've had. But the thing about traveling with a plant pathologist, a real one, an excellent one, is you get to see things that you wouldn't have necessarily picked up before. And this is just one telling example. This is a plant called chromalina. It is an invasive weed. It's just there. Now, there are weeds all over the planet, and I'll talk about them more. But the interesting thing about this is that it poisons the soil. It grows and it produces chemicals from its roots, which stops all other plants growing. And so it's a massive threat for agriculture. And, and you can figure that out quite easily, just searching through a scientific journal. But the other thing that Harry was able to teach me was that the Ghanaians think it's their plants. They, they, he, was, he was in exactly the same spot 40 years ago, because we went back to look for these fungi. And it wasn't there before. I, I, and he could tell me that, oh, in that short space of time, they have adopted this plant. It has become really important to them. They use it for 101 different things, as the, as the government has said, such as embalming bodies. And so when CABI, this organization, which is the, the parallel of USDA, when that tried to have a, uh, have a control program, they said, no, we don't want to control it. It's good. We use it for embalming bodies. And so it becomes very quickly part of the culture. And this societal aspect has been very informative to me because it, it shows you all the different barriers you can have. You can have local barriers as well as just the, 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 the general national barriers for, for actually getting the money in and doing a control program. So meanwhile, we have these problems and, and, and agriculture is made that much more difficult because of a pest that people think is a good thing. So th this has really opened my eyes about the complexity of disease in plants. Many people have studied the domestication of plants, and we have a very good view of what's happening. Um, we, we know the centers of origins of a lot of them, and I just want to go through one example, which is, uh, you, you might well know about, which is the Fertile Crescent, where uh, 10,000 years ago we domesticated cereals. And this is a slide from my colleague in, in Zurich, um, Bruce McDonald, 
And so you can see that out of uh, very humble beginnings, we have covered the world with, with a crop which is fundamentally important to us. So in the early stages, as the massive ice, uh, ice uh, field moved away from Europe, the early settlers, the Neolithic man, was able to move into northern Europe, then into India, China, and it took a long time before wheat was transported across um, the Atlantic into the Americas, and then into South Africa, and then into Australia. So we have domesticated this in one particular part of the world, and then we moved it all, all around the world. And that has been repeat, a repeated pattern for a range of crops. So what I want to do is not talk about the domestication of crops. I want to talk about the diseases that go along with those. And it's going to be instructional to give you some stories about plant diseases, to talk about the science and the politics and the history and the trade. So I'm going to go through a little bit of a timeline. I'm going to look at all the diseases, how they changed, how we viewed crop destruction from a scientific perspective. Um, how diseases forced the English to drink tea, and how the diseases even elected a president. And then I'll come on to things that we're facing our, in our recent past, in the last 20 or 30 years, and then things which could absolutely, with no sense of exaggeration, change the world economy in a period of two months. So, the Irish potato famine. When many people Talk, have chapters on plant diseases, talk about plant diseases in scientific publications, the Irish potato famine is very much a starting point. You have an, an essay by Harry Evans, a book chapter by Harry Evans as part of your handout, and he also begins with this. It is a very useful story for an, a, a wide range of reasons, um, both in terms of the problems of overpopulation, demographics, sociology, poor government. The whole range of factors are important in this regard, but I'm going to focus on diseases and plants. So the potato is an enormously interesting crop. It was domesticated in Peru about seven or 8,000 years ago. We know there's some really nice genetic work by David Spooner at USDA. And from that domesticate, domesticated origin, um, it has spread throughout the world, of course. Um, it's a very interesting crop because it uses far less water than grains, and it provides much, much more nutrients than grains. And as a consequence of that, people are rediscovering the potatoes. So since the 1960s, there has been a large increase in the crop. Uh, this graph is showing you from 91 to 2007. The red line is the, uh, the global production of potatoes, and the green is production in developed countries, and yellow is production, production in developing countries. So developing countries, particularly China, particularly India, are starting to have a large-scale production of potatoes because they're recognizing the usefulness of this crop. Depending on which, which measure you look at, it's the third or fourth most uh, uh, used crop in the world. Much, much far behind wheat, so wheat and rice, of course, but, but gaining in importance. It was, of course, the principal food of the Irish uh, before 1845. We essentially ate nothing else. Um, our, it was an interesting uh, economy that we had going at the time. Um, I was born in Dublin. For a year, I lived in Letter Frack, which is on the west coast of Ireland. Uh, at the age of 15, I was uh, kicked out of school uh, for, my, for my misdemeanors. And so I just sort of bummed around for four or five years. Um, and in that, I had the great fortune of living in the west of Ireland, where I worked in, a mo in what was formerly a monastery. This was set up by the Quakers in the 1840s for the relief of the poor following the Irish famine. So a lot of people came over and, and had public works, just like you had in the Depression area here in the States. Uh, people couldn't farm. There was no food. Let's get them involved in doing something else. So I, I worked in a, that, that was an industrial school, and I worked in the monastery at the hostel. So I worked there for a while. And I also worked on a farm for Connemara ponies, um, where I would take tourists out. And it was really special to spend a year in this location. Because even 150 years after the famine, you can see the scars on the landscape because of this enormous production. So what these lines are showing you are the former raised beds of potatoes. 
in Ireland, what we did was used to heap soil up into raised beds and then grow the potatoes here. The, the English agriculturists thought this was a very lazy and impractical way to do so, but it was very useful because Ireland is particularly wet. Uh, you could actually classify it as a, as a tropical rainforest if it actually had trees and, tro and, and warm weather. Uh, it has that much rain. And so, so this was the landscape. We had no trees. We had far, uh, fields covered in rocks. And so what you're able to do is divide your land up by just mounting them into, into walls, take the very same stones, and then make a house out of that. We've been building these stone walls for 5,000 years. So it's a very easy life to have. And in addition, you can burn the ground. We have bogs. You can cut the bogs into turf. You can stack it, and you can burn that. So it was never the case that the Irish were cold. We had plenty of food, and we had great heat. It was easy to collect. I, I, in, even in Dublin in the 1980s, we grew up burning turf. This is a picture from 1973 showing just how prominent it has been. And so basically what the Irish did is they sat around drinking, laughing, dancing, and, and making lots and lots of children. And that was the problem because we had an overpopulation. It was a perfect storm. The only thing we ate was potatoes. It was three times more energy efficient than anything else. We had no grain. Um, there was a number of important laws in England which actually would prevent the Irish from selling grain, so it wasn't that they could use it. We had no money-based economy, we just had potatoes. And so what we had was a large population. Just before the famine, we had about 9 million people. Immediately afterwards, 1 million people died and 2 million people emigrated. And so this is, I think, sociologists and demographers use this as an example for how not to do things, how not to have a single staple crop which a country depends upon. And of course, as Americans, you know the important story of the, the, the Irish famine because um, a large proportion of individuals went to the States. So between 1845 and 1914, five million people emigrated to America. In the US census of 2000, one in five people classify themselves as being Irish American. So it has left an indelible print, not just upon your country, but also upon many countries across the world. So what about the science of it? What do we understand when the disease arrived? Well, the first thing we knew, where we, we, could, we could sort of characterize it and talk about it, and so we knew there was a great mal malady, we knew it was in the continent, uh, in Belgium, it was in, in England, Covent Garden is a, an important marker in England, so it wasn't just restricted to here. Uh, as a confessional, I would say, it actually came from America across. It came from South America through America in the 1830s across the, the, the Atlantic to Europe. And, and we were able to look at it and we could see that the first obvious signs were some black marks and then the plant would sort of um, get progressively worse and then it was a terrible stench. But even if it didn't look bad, even if you pulled those potatoes out of the ground very quickly, within days it was gone. The whole point about potatoes is you pull them out and you store them over winter and somewhere cool and dry, but this was impossible. So um, everybody feared the worst, which was that it would actually move across the Irish Sea into Ireland, and that's exactly what it did. Um, and John Lindley, the, the editor of this uh, Gardener's Chronicle, uh, made a big, a big um, uh, um, uh, exclamatory point that we're really in trouble now. 1845 was when the famine hit Ireland. And I wanted to give you a context here about how science had developed up until that point. The great ocean-going nations of Europe had been going all over the world for many hundreds of years. They had been collecting a large number of, of, of scientific specimens. We started to build museums. And these got progressively more and more detailed. We started to organize things. We came up with a scientific classification scheme. And um, uh, um, through the invention of the microscope, we were able to go in much, much more detail and look at a whole range of different biological processes. Robert Hooke came up with his very famous book uh, uh, looking at the detailed aspects of life. Uh, Van, Van, um, Van Leeuwenhoek uh, inventing the microscope. So we were able to look at a lot of e things which were not immediately obvious. How an insect egg, such as an ant's egg, 
turns into an adult ant. We were able to resolve a lot of these details. In 1859, we have, of course, had the climax with the publication by Charles Darwin of The Origin of the Species, where, which had been built up over 40 years of his personal research, collecting it. The essential point here was the science was in a very, very good state. We knew a lot about the natural world. Uh, we knew a lot about agricultural science. In 1855, Penn State began. And this is a picture of, of how well developed even it was by 1859. So we knew a great deal about science. We didn't, however, know anything about infectious diseases. The study of infectious diseases is germ theory, showing that germs go from one organism to another, and that's why they have an, a disease. Um, so the fungus on the potato was assumed to be a consequence and not the cause of it. And it turned into a very uh, a vitriolic and an important argument between Dr. Lindley and Reverend Berkeley in order to understand what happened. And Berkeley, the history of time, tells us that he won because he actually resolved what the disease was. And he did this in a very nice and important way that we still use today, which is the comparative method. He looked at a similar disease in t on potatoes in, in Hertfordshire in England and in France through a colleague of his. Uh, he also looked at a disease on, on, on onions. And he looked, he, he, he had knew about some phenomenal work in 1835 by Agostini Bassi in Italy on, on worms, which were raised for the silk industry, which also had a fungal disease. Um, and so he proposed that what's causing this is the fungus, which he was finding there. And this is a radical departure from previous assessments of disease. And it really was a, a novel direction. Pasteur is, of course, credited with the germ theory, as is Koch, a German scientist. But of course, it was all based upon Berkeley uh, and plant pathology. So plant pathology was actually the first time we actually got a handle on how diseases spread. Um, and this gentleman, Anton de Barry, which Marilyn Rusnick mentioned last week, the chap who came up with the concept symbiosis, he brought it much, much further. Uh, he started to do experimentation. He infected plants with the agent, which was now given the name Phytophthora infestans. He infected them, and he proved the disease happened. Uh, and then he, not only did he do that, but he trained a whole generation of plant pathologists which have gone out into the world and resolved a lot of the problems that we have seen and understood a lot. And it's rather an interesting perspective, just as a scientist, that general science, uh, general biology, general epidemiology, largely ignores the contribution of plant pathology. And uh, I can't for the life of me understand why that is. So the organism which killed all those potatoes is called Phytophthora infestans. It is not, in fact, a fungus, as we heard about in question time last week. It's a, it's a different organism, but it may as well be a fungus. It, it smells like a fungus, it acts like a fungus, and it does things like a fungus. In fact, uh, work by my colleagues in Exeter, Tom Gilbert and Nick Talbot, has, has shown that it even takes the genome of fungi and eats them. As it eats fungi, it takes the genes. So you can look at the genome of Phytophthora infestans and find out that 25% of what's inside this organism is actually fungal genes. And of course, it only takes the most virulent, the most pathogenic. It just goes around picking and choosing. So it's an absolutely amazing organism. Uh, not only has it destroyed the Irish, uh, the Irish economy, it is des destroying uh, oak forests in California. Tens of thousands of trees have been killed. So it's a formidable pest. And that explains, or, or the name is quite appropriate, Phytophthora means destroyer of plants. Phyto, of course, is, is plant, Thor, as in, as, in, as in the Norse god with the big hammer, um, destroys plants. And infestance just means uh, a, a, a disease which is rampant. So the Irish potato famine, as, as tragic as it was, gave us the birth of our formalized the study of infectious diseases. The other way that diseases have been important in plants is that they can really change a lot of the aspects of nations. So George Bernard Shaw said that America and England are uh, two nations divided by a common language. And they are also, of course, divided by a lot of other things, such as the beverages that they take. Tea is intimately associated with the English, 
and coffee is intimately associated with the Americans. And what I'm going to do now is explain to you that the reason for all of this is a plant disease. So this is, of course, the Boston Tea Party. What I want to do is bring you through a history of coffee and show you that um, uh, once upon a time, the English loved it, but disease has taken that opportunity away. So coffee was uh, the center of origin. It evolved in Ethiopia, and it was used by the Arabs as early as 1100 AD. And they really knew they were onto a good thing. They traded it, and it was very important to them. The word coffee comes from uh, an Arabic word, uh, true with Turkish translation, uh, that we have, we've come to adopt it in our language. Um, it was used since the 1600s in England as a beverage all day. So if you've ever read Tactory or Dickens, you see that they start the day with a pint of beer, not because they're, they're inveterate alcoholics, but simply because the water was so horrible. And so they, of necessity, they had to drink other, other things, and coffee was very important in that regard. Coffee is the second largest commodity in the world after oil. It's incredibly important. In 1825, the, the Brits had, had taken um, uh, Sri Lanka, which was then called Ceylon, they had taken it from the Dutch, and they started to use it for the plantation of coffees. Um, and this is the consequence why we still have the term Java, which is Indonesia, why we still associate that with coffee. And then disaster happened through the introduction of a pest which is this coffee rust fungus I'll show you pictures of. And at the time this entered uh, Sri Lanka in 1850, uh, 1875, nearly 400,000 acres were covered with coffee trees. It was just wall-to-wall -wall coffee. And again, an example like in the Irish situation, it was a perfect storm waiting for an epidemic to come true. And that's exactly what happened. It went from eight, 100 million pounds of coffee a year 95% reduction in the production of coffee caused by this one, one fungus which entered and devastated the entire industry. The English immediately switched to tea and this is the reason why Southeast Asia is a place where we have massive tea productions and we have no longer coffee because it's not sustainable. The parasite got in and now completely prevents uh, the, 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 the uh, commercial production of coffee. It would be another 100 years before this disease reached the Americas. So the Americans were able, the South Americans and the North Americans were able to continue in the coffee production in the absence of disease. And this is why the English drink tea and the Americans drink coffee. This is an advertisement uh, for coffee from the, one of the early houses in 1600s. And they treated coffee just as we did. For example, it's good at about 3 or 4 o'clock in the afternoon. This is the beast which has caused the problem. It's coffee rust. This is a devastated tree in um, Brazil. It forms these pustules, just like the, if I can be so crude, just like the spots that one might find on a face. It really is like that. It just explodes out with hundreds of thousands of spores coming from a single leaf. These spores are uh, uh, wonderfully uh, adapted for their for for, for long uh, stage transmission, but also they have these extremely interesting spikes on them. And we don't really know what that is, but we speculate that as they're flying through the air, these spikes allow them, like grappling hooks, to grab onto the underside of the leaf and be embedded, giving them this, the the kickstart they need. If anybody ha wants to ask a question, you can ask about the interesting sex which is going on here which has just been recently discovered, which complicates the situation greatly. The other story I wanted to tell you was about how chocolate, a disease in chocolate, has elected a, a president in Brazil. Chocolate is an enormously interesting crop. It has evolved in the upper Amazon basin. It's a, it's a rainforest tree. It has been taken all over the world because of its great importance. Um, Getting to the etymology again, how we name things, it's called Teobromo cacao. It was named by the father of the naming system, Linnaeus. And what he did, which I think is very, very nice, he combined a Mayan word with a Latin word. Teobroma, means, teobroma is food of the gods, and cacao is a Mayan word uh, which reflects its, 
its, its, its origins, which at that time they believed was from, uh, from the gods having been deposited inside a mountain. So it's a really interesting etymology. On a snowy day like today, about 500 feet to your left or your right, I'm not sure, there are cacao trees. Uh, uh, we, uh, Penn State has a, has a center of research, a globally important center of research on, on cocoa, cacao or cocoa, whichever way you say it, uh, run by Mark Giltonen and Ciela Maximova. This is them. This is their tree. And it's just a nice idea that we have this little tropical uh, nugget not far from where we are now. Um, cocoa was distributed from its origins in the Amazon basin by the, the, uh, the, the ancient Indians uh, right throughout Mesoamerica. Columbus came over, took it, so did Cortez, brought it back to Europe. Europeans thought it was disgusting, and then they added a little bit of sugar, and then they felt it was getting a bit better. And then the, they, they uh, instituted production, and it became incredibly important to them. It has a wide range of diseases. These diseases have evolved, co-evolved in the, in the center of origin, and they have moved out after the production. One of them which I want to speak about is witch's broom, which is a very important fungus that can destroy whole crops. For example, here, this is, is an extremely healthy uh, production of uh, cocoa, and this is one which has been destroyed. What happens, the disease causes the, the, the branches to curl up, uh, so they, they look like witches' brooms. And this is it. it then it, 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 it makes these little mushrooms which grow out of the pods. The center of origin of cocoa is up here. Early on, the production was in the Amazon basin, for example, around places like Manaus. But it became ever more difficult because the disease just wouldn't let the, the plant grow. And so since this area of Brazil is a tropical rainforest, they said, well, let's go and cut down the forest and grow it there. And that's exactly what they did. And then the cocoa barrens became enormously, enormously rich. It, it, was, it, was, a, it was a highly affluent society due to this production. The cocoa barons were conservative, and they had political candidates that they wanted to keep in place, not a story dissimilar to any of us in modern times. And the Workers' Party, they wanted their own different candidates. But they couldn't fight against the barons in terms of money because they didn't have it. What they did was they took the disease from here and moved it over there. This is 2,000 miles of dry land, the Chatingas. There is no way that the disease would move naturally. And what we also found, or what the investigative reporters found, that hanging in these trees were these crumpled witch's brooms, so the physical evidence of it. So this is non-state-sanctioned bioterrorism, and the first example of non-state-sanctioned bioterrorism. Because in t thinking about diseases, there is state-sanctioned bioterrorism. The Americans uh, made a stockpile of rust diseases in the 1960s in the eventual, uh, and, tried to, and also with the intention of dropping it on uh, the former USSR and, and many countries besides. And you can read about this in, in Harry's uh, very nice handout. It was published in Scientific American, the Brazilian equivalent of that, immediately retracted. But it is strong evidence that the, 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 the Socialist Party used a, bio, a fungal agent as a bioterrorist tool, leading to the, 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 the advancement of uh, da Silva into being a mayor, and then ultimately into being the president of Brazil. So that's history. What I want to talk about are just some immediate threats now. Cassava is a wonderful crop, which has come from South America, introduced into Africa about 300 years ago. It's a very wonderful crop, which produces a wide range of natural deterrents, uh, uh, cyanide-like compounds, which prevents African bugs just jumping on it and eating it. Um, and so consequently, it grew very well. But in 1973, accidentally, two pests were introduced from the native range, a green mite and a mealybug. In Africa, there are 27 or 28 countries in the cassava belt which produce food. The introduction of these pests immediately um, threatened the food supply of 800 million people. The crop production, which was 100%, went down to 5 and 10%. It was an absolute disaster. Thankfully, at that time, plant pathology was well respected. 
we were in a position to have an internationally coordinated effort between uh, a wide range of different organizations in Africa, Caribbean, and South America. Teams, hundreds of scientists jumped in and were able to find uh, our hero, which for, for the mealybug was this rather innocuous little wasp. The introduction of this wasp after quarantining in, 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 in England, in, in something which is called classical biocontrol, the introduction of this led to recovering the cassava crop. So the losses went from 90% down to only 10%. And it is not an exaggeration to say that this beast saved the food supply for hundreds of millions of people. Currently, we face something of a similar situation. Uh, this is a rust. I'm going to talk about a disease in plants, which was found first in, in 1999. Uh, that's why it's called 99. And it was found in Uganda. It's a UG99. It has been a problem, and it potentially can be a much, much worse problem. So rusts have been known for thousands of years. There are references in the Bible to rusts on cereals. Remember, we domesticated cereals 10,000 years ago. We have exported them throughout Europe and India, so it's not surprising they've become a very important part of our cultural heritage. Um, I mentioned some of those spores which, which, with the grappling hooks on the back which can fly through the air. This is one of five spores. They're, they're very, very difficult and very complicated life histories. Um, and they tend to be very specific on particular races of grasses or cereals or wheat. I won't even begin to go into this slide. I just put it up there to show you the great complications which can exist in understanding life histories of diseases. And thankfully, many, many scientists have dedicated long, long careers to doing exactly this. So this is what UG99 is. It's a stem rust, so it infects only the stems as opposed to the roots or the leaves or any other part of the plant, and it completely destroys it. It was first... Um, discovered in Uganda, and then it moved um, uh, all the way to India. And the most important aspect about this is, is that it moved across the strait, of, um, the, the strait and, and moved through areas which are incredibly arid and very, very, very much a desert. And so demonstrating for this organism its enormous potential in moving. So it was able to go like this. It is a, what's called a transboundary disease because of its, of its ability to jump over boundaries such as water, all the way to India. And so this is the risk zone that we have at the moment. And in green, you see the production that we have. So for example, in northern India, we have an awful lot of wheat growing and an awful lot of people depending on that wheat. And we have a highly virulent pathogen which is now spreading. This is a, a list of er, different, um, different rusts. So stem rust is the one that we're talking about at the moment. And these are the places where um, it's a minor uh, component. And most interesting is it's a minor component in North America. You, of course, have an enormous breadbasket, which is uh, very important. And, and frankly, a few suitcases of this rust would do a great degree of damage. We have a, an historical example of this, which is another disease called Vir YR9, and it shows exactly the same pathway. But unfortunately, UG99, for whatever reason, and we're trying to understand that, it's a very, uh, a very different organism in that it has a much greater toll exerted upon the, the, the crop. It's much, much more virulent, it's much, much more damaging, and it spreads uh, that much quicker. So throughout this talk, I've been trying to emphasize examples of uh, potential catastrophes, using historic examples, those in the last 20 or 30 years, or in the case of UG99, which is ongoing. And so I won't go into much about what could happen in the future. Of course, many, many bad things could happen in the future. But I just want to draw attention to rubber. Rubber is from a tree, um, which as its name, as binomial classification, as its name suggests, uh, arose in South America, uh, Brasiliensis. It arose in Brazil. It was, it was first used there. It's a tree which is tapped 
for the production of the worker. It's a highly intensive industry. You go out every morning, you cut the tree, you collect the sap, you use it. 40% of the world's rubber production comes from this tree, 60% from synthetic sources. And so you might be forgiven for thinking, well, the chemist will come up with a solution. But in fact, the very, very, very best rubber comes from the rubber tree. And we can't imitate that at the moment. Maybe in the future we can. So we depend highly upon that for a whole range of things, from your car tires to the, to the gloves used during operations. Most of the production of rubber, rubber about 85% of it, comes from Southeast Asia. Uh, particularly Thailand is a very, very important country for the production of rubber. Once upon a time, it was all in Brazil. Um, but unfortunately, the disease is now there. The disease has co-evolved in Brazil, and as soon as they started massive uh, operations, massive um, cultivation practices with hundreds of thousands of trees, the disease just thought this was fabulous, an enormously big lunch table, and just wiped through it. And a, a really great folly was Henry Ford, um, uh, his endeavor to build a city in the Amazon called Fordlandia. This guy had arrogance beyond belief. Uh, not once did he consult a scientific uh, uh, researcher and said what might happen. So he went there, he built a city, he planted hundreds of thousands of trees, and not one single drop of rubber was ever collected. Such is the devastating impact of plant diseases. So it really matters where the crop is. Now you can imagine what would happen if that disease can get in. And in fact, such is the threat of this, the UN has listed the organism, um, Microcyclus ulliae, it has listed this as a bioterrorist uh, organism. So the movement of this is, is, is prohibited in the same way as, as uh, you know, uh, uh, uranium for a dirty bomb or such things. It's that important. Um, so I've been emphasizing the movement of agriculture, and I want to just go into some details again about this. Um, we've seen that we have extensive movement, for example, the potato from Peru to, to Europe, uh, coffee from Ethiopia to Sri Lanka, and then the Americas, cocoa, um, Ecuador, and cassava, South America. I want to talk about not about agriculture for a moment, but just about ecology. Um, we move things around, for example, these crabs moved from Europe to first the eastern seaboard of the US, Victoria, Tasmania, South Africa, and also to the western seaboard. This crab is from America, this crab is from Europe. They're exactly the same species. The reason this crab is huge is because it left all its parasites behind. And if you don't have parasites, you can grow that much bigger and that much healthier, and you become that much more invasive. So this is a list of all the parasites that you would see in Europe, and look at all the zeros in all the other parts of the world. It hasn't completely eradicated everything. Sometimes it might adopt a parasite in a new location, but it doesn't have near the amount it has in these places. And it's, it's called enemy release. You have been released from your enemy because you've been moved from one location to another. This really important paper by Mitchell and Power in Nature makes a point with plants. These are not agricultural plants. They're just regular plants moved uh, from, from gardens in Europe to gardens in America. This is the native range in Europe, and this is the naturalized range in the US. This is the number of parasites you have in the US. Or there's a magnitude less parasites in the introduced range. This is another way of looking at it. This is the proportional release of, uh, from pathogens. So all, these are all individual plants. So some plants have very, very, very few pathogens, and some have some. And this is how noxious we consider those plants, or how invasive we have. And there's a highly significant statistical relationship between just how nasty these plants can be when they don't have the parasites. So this is an example from ecology, because I want to return again to, to plant pathology. Here's another, just a picture to graphically represent this. This is a disease, which is a plant, plant weed, which is in Australia, causing enormous problems. This is all over the world. So when you go and try to figure this out, you adopt the, the, the approach of classical uh, biocontrol. So this is a project that Harry Evans was involved in, Cabby and other scientists, just like that wasp on cassava. They found this rust in Madagascar. They introduced it to Australia. They saved the Australian government $250 million. So 
So in the course of human agriculture, we have, dem- we have benefited enormously from enemy relief. We have taken potatoes from Peru to Ireland and for hundreds of years grew them wonderfully and we had massive crops. They were like those big fat crabs. We were, we were onto a good thing. But eventually the disease caught up with us. And coffee really exemplifies this because in the case of those crabs moving from Europe to America, we just sent a few of them in the ballast of ships, for example. And just by chance, they didn't have any diseases. So there's a couple of hundred of you in this room. I guess 20% of you are suffering from the flu, for example. If I was just to pick you by random, chances are I wouldn't get somebody with the flu. And that's what happens when we take organisms from one place to another, just by chance. But in the case of agricultural crops, it's even much, much, much more rare to bring crops with diseases into the new location. And I think coffee really exemplifies this. So the Arabs, as I mentioned, had been growing coffee since 1100 AD, and they were the first to employ terminator ecology, or terminator uh, technology. So remember I said there's nothing new under the sun. You may disagree with Monsanto and seeds, which can never be used from one year to another because of terminator genes. The Arabs have been doing this for hundreds of years by blanching the seeds in boiling water, which they could sell, People could, Europeans could buy them, but they couldn't grow them. So I thought that was interesting. So the Dutch said, we're a major nation, we're sailing all over the world, we can't be having our Arabs telling us what to do. So they smuggled the trees out, brought them to Europe. And in 1714, the mayor of Amsterdam, in amazing stupidity, gave a tree to King Louis XIV as a diplomatic gift. Here you go, there's a tree, have fun. King Louis XIV, was not thinking of agricultural production. He liked this tree. He put it in the Jardin de Plantes in, in Paris. But the gift of this tree would untopple the Dutch as the major leaders in coffee. And remember, sailing all over the world requires a lot of money, and crops such as coffee were very important in funding this exploration. So I want to tell you the story of Captain Gabriel de Clou. He was a French naval officer living in Martinique in the Caribbean. When he was returning to France, he thought he had an opportunity of increasing coffee production in the Caribbean. And so what he did was he stole into the, into the Jardin de Plantes and stole a tree. Not exactly like that. What he used was a lady of some persuasion um, who went to the... The, the, the chief surgeon of King Louis XIV, Monsieur Chirac, and she, with her wily ways, persuaded him to give a tree to uh, Captain Gabriel. And so he was able to get this tree away. It was just one of the, 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 the offspring of the original tree. Yes, a lady of quality to whom Monsieur de Chirac could give no refusal, was how, was how he put it in a letter when he wrote back. And in 1723, he set sail on a ship for Martinique. The ship was attacked by pirates. Uh, it was heavily defended. It was able to repel the pirates. Along the way, he kept the, the plants in a, a, a specially constructed box, which also had a glass roof to prevent too much sea spray coming on top of it. A fellow passenger was rather jealous of this and actually had a fight with him. And they, they had to, you can imagine these two guys fighting on board a ship over, over a plant. And the, he repelled also that attacker, but the attacker was able to pull off a branch. But he, he was writing back to say he, he succeeded, uh, this, guy, this guy didn't win. But the most interesting thing was you're sailing for three months across the Atlantic, it's hot, it's dry, and there's not that much water to drink. And this poor chap had to share his water rations with his beloved plant. And so he did a little bit for me, a little bit for you, a little bit for me, a little bit for you. This went on for three months. Upon arrival, things had not finished. He had to have his... Uh, his um, plant guarded day and night by slaves. He built a fortress of thorns all around it. But he succeeded in planting a coffee tree, originally from a single plant taken from the, by the Dutch from the Arabs in Ethiopia, brought to Amsterdam, brought to Paris, then brought across the Atlantic in. And he, he succeeded in planting it, and it was successful. It grew, it produced seeds. 
he replanted it. He went from one tree in the course of 50 years to nearly 19 million trees. From there, it went all over the Caribbean, and from there, it went all over South America. Much of the coffee that we drink is descended from this single tree. For those of you who have seen the lectures last year, and in particular the lecture by Andrew Reid, when he showed an enormous factory-style production of chickens, and he was rather taken aback about the epidemiological consequences of putting thousands upon thousands of chickens in one place, all the same age, the potential for disease spread is enormous. It's exactly the same in agriculture, and especially when we, we have beginnings just from very small numbers, because the genetic resistance simply is not there. This is why the disease, when it did reach Sri Lanka, wiped out the, the coffee industry for the, Brits, for the Brits. So the enemies catch up, whether it's coffee in, in plants, or it's uh, the disease in potatoes, or it's in cassava millibugs. More important, I think, or more devastating, is adoption. When those plants are put into new locations, they can adopt diseases. And there are funny ways of thinking about this. For example, in Cuba, the national plant is wild ginger. This has evolved in Southeast Asia. It doesn't exist there, but it's been there for hundreds of years, so the Cubans think it, it's there, so they adopted it. In this case, in Hawaii, it's also been adopted in ceremony to the ancestors. This lady, in all earnestness, I believe she thinks that this is a native plant. That for, for, for hundreds of years, Hawaiians, thousands of years, have done this, but it doesn't belong in Hawaii. Where it belongs is on, the, is on the list of the top 100 invasive plants in the world. This is it there. It is causing catastrophic problems in Hawaii because of this. So what I want to do is just, uh, coming to a close now, but what I want to do is go through a disease which I've started to work on because I, I, I think it's, it's extremely interesting and extremely important. Um, I'm going to take away the legend here, but it's on your handout. Um, so this is a typical situation in West Africa, in Ghana. This is a cassava plant. This, difficult to see, is a cocoa plant, so a cocoa tree. They typically require shade in order to grow, so the farmers use plantain as a source of shade, which can protect them. Um, so this is called intercropping. The small farms the size of football fields in Africa will contain a wide variety of different plants at different stages. This is what it looks like when you're drying cassava. This is uh, drying uh, cocoa beans. And this is the plantain. This tree is from the rainforest. The rainforest is no longer there. We have chopped it down to have agriculture, but we kept the tree for whatever reason. Inside this tree, there is a virus called cocoa swollen shoot virus. It also has a different name, but this virus is not a problem to that tree. The virus is a problem to cocoa. So we have kept around the tree, and the virus has jumped between the tree and the cocoa plant. The cocoa plant is from South America. It has never, ever met this tree before at all, the reason it gets into the tree is because of plant feeding insects. Uh, you can see them up here, the little mealy bugs. So we've also kept them. We've removed 99.99% of the biodiversity. We seem remarkably to have kept just the ones which are bad. This, uh, this virus causes a swollen shoot in the young cocoa plant and can kill the plants. Uh, between 28 and 45% of the crop is lost because of this virus. There's another disease which is spectacularly bad. It's also Phytophthora. Remember our old friend from the Irish potato famine? It's producing this white here, this pod in which the seeds are kept. is completely lost. This crop is lost. As much as 80% of a tree's crop can be lost because of this. The, 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 the Phytophthora, the fungal-like organism, is sporulating, and little flies, once upon a time they lived in the rainforest, there is no rainforest, little flies come along and eat, eat this and disperse it throughout the environment. The most interesting thing is here, though, for me. These are um, um, nests constructed by ants. It is co-evolved in the rainforest. The ants construct this nest in order to protect uh, plant-feeding insects. You can see them just there. There's the ant. Here's another species. I've taken, I've taken this nest material away. I, I made a remark earlier on that that certain countries have invested heavily in science formerly and don't do so now. 
in the 1970s, the British government made a very strong point to invest in Ghanaian science. They built entire research centers, hospitals, schools, employed the very, very best scientists, people like Barry Bolton and Dennis Leston and Harry Evans and others, who spent years doing research. So one particular report uh, by a guy called Strickland, he collected 186,000 of these little nests just to establish that, yeah, most of them contain ants of a particular species and a, and a, and a plant-feeding insect of a particular type. And this sort of research is highly intensive, but it's highly, highly important. And we don't do that anymore, regrettably. So this is the disease that we have. The story gets, uh, for me, gets uh, much worse. When Phytophthora gets, the reason, Phytophthora megacaria, this particular organism, it has evolved in the rainforest of Cameroon. It lives naturally on fallen fruits of rainforest trees. The fruit falls down, the fungal-like organism eats it. It's in the soil. The nest that these ants make in order to protect the insects which are injecting the virus, the nest is made up out of soil. The ants go to the ground, collect the soil, and in so doing, collect the spores of this fungal-like organism and bring it up onto the cocoa plant. The reason the Phytophthora can be so virulent, so damaging, is because it has a partner in crime. The virus that I told you about, which is injected into the plant, reduces the osmotic pressure of the plant. The plant just doesn't pump water as well as it should. And its inability to produce water sort of opens a little back door for the fungal-like organism to get in there. So these two are acting together. And for me, what is a devastating picture is this picture. This is a healthy pod. Everything looks well. As mentioned in one of your handouts, African farmers use these things like ATM machines. When they need food for, for medicine or school or additional sources of food, they just go and collect the pods and they sell them. This looks absolutely healthy. This one is diseased. There's nothing that they can take from in here because it's infected by Phytophthora megacaria. There are no ants. There are no plant-injecting plant insects. There are no, there's no soil. The interaction between the virus and the fungal-like organisms and the plant-feeding insects and the ants have all acted negatively and in a synergistic way to allow the fungus-like organism to be inside the plant permanently and then bounce back out. This is called cushion effect. The fungus has been in the tree. As soon as the tree produces this, it comes back out and affects the pods. You may go there and get rid of the ants and think you're doing a good job, or the plants feeding insects, or the soil, but the whole event is complicated by this sort of uh, merry-go-round of disease, which makes the problem persistent and chronic. I think, for me, this represents one of the major failures that we have, because when I learned about this in November, there's really only two or three other people who would know about this. You might gleam it from printed, non-electronically stored papers in the Cocoa Research Institute of Ghana, you might gleam it. But putting the whole package together was really because I was able to talk to this guy, Evans, who'd worked on diseases on, 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 on cocoa, on, on uh, plants. And this is catastrophic because 79% of, of cocoa production comes from Africa. And you might think, well, chocolate is a luxury. It's not. 10% of Ghanaian gross domestic product comes from chocolate. And so losing this crop, which we really could because of this uh, merry-go-round of disease, has enormous and far-reaching consequences. And currently in science, we're focused on, for me, focused on different aspects. So what can Penn State do? This is the mural on the walls here of uh, Lincoln, uh, representing the Morrill Act of 1862, where Lincoln signed into law the land-grant status of Penn State and many, many other institutes besides. At the time, a lot of people in the US were farmers. This has, of course, declined enormously, such that who knows a farmer. Um, but that's not the situation globally. Uh, globally, people globally, are like you, the, the American economy was 150 years ago. But unfortunately, we're not putting a lot of research into science. This is total research spending on agricultural sciences. 
it's increasing, but mainly it's driven by private spending. Private investment is a very, very good thing, but it solves problems which are useful only for uh, Western societies. Uh, public spending is, is leveling off. The situation is very dire. A Royal, Royal Institute report uh, showed it was a 58% reduction in uh, spending. And basically, as, as uh, Tom Lupkin, who's taken over from Norman Borlaug in the, the Mays Institute, he said, we really only have ourselves to blame. We're choosing leaders who don't have history books, who don't understand the lessons of the past, the good ones and the bad ones. For me, the sh one of the shining graces of American society is philanthropy. Um, it's really impressive. So the Green Revolution just came about from a conversation between the then US president and the president of the Rockefeller Institute. One said to the other, if you want to help developing countries, in that case Mexico, fill their bellies and you can make an enormous contribution. This is being brought forward. Uh, I think the work of the Gates is, is, is fundamentally important. Uh, Rockefeller, of course, they funded the original Green Revolution. Those two are now in close partnership in, in, in formulating a plan with AGRA. And so this is, provides an enormous opportunity, I think, because the money is out there, the will is out there. So what can we do? What can Penn State do? We were set up in order to help local farmers in Pennsylvania deal with local problems. But I think we can adapt to globalization. In the same way we can outsource American jobs to China and India, we can also outsource uh, not outsource, but we can, in, in a sort of reverse outsourcing we, can, outsourcing, we can take scientific development and we can bring that to uh, developing nations. So we can take advantage of globalization. We have a public mission and we have, thankfully, world-class science. Um, as I mentioned, we've created this environment which is incredibly interdisciplinary and you can work across boundaries very, very easily. And we understand evolution disease. So in, in approaching this cocoa problem, what I was able to do with remarkable ease was bring together um, seven faculty from Penn State, match them with two people in Ghana, throw in somebody from Switzerland, and it was easy to bring this whole package together. And we have a fluidity here, which is not represented in, in many other institutes. And I think that for me, that's a very attractive point. So my conclusion, in case you didn't get the accent at the start, civilization and anarchy are only seven meals away. And the solutions to this problem lie in, in learning the lessons from the past. So thank you very much indeed for your attention. Quit your questions, please. Hold up your questions, please. Dr. Hughes, please explain more about how the rust saved the Australian government $350 million? It was introduced. It went through all the classical biocontrol uh, strategies. It was brought into a lab in, in the UK. It was tested for its effect on other plants. We established that it just killed that one particular plant which was causing a problem. It didn't have any cross effects. And then it was released en masse and basically just killed it in the same way the rust fungus kill the coffee plants in Sri Lanka and, and it, it allowed the native fauna to bounce back because the, the costs involved were eradication costs and also major, major costs on Australian agricultural development. Okay, tell us about the sex life of the coffee rust. So coffee rust for a long time was thought to be asexual. It was, it was, it, and we would think, well, we're throwing all these chemical weapons at it, these pesticides, and it's constantly outwitting us. And the reason an organism can outwit anything we throw at it is because of evolution. It's responding in an evolved sense. And so evolution works in two different ways. If you're asexual, such that you make a carbon copy of yourself, you, you don't have novelty in the system. But when you have sex and you move genes around between organisms, you can have novelty. And it's a novelty which allows organisms to respond to any changes uh, that we throw at them. And so what Harry and others have discovered is that this asexual organism has cryptosexuality. It's, it, it, it's recombining its genomes inside it in a way that we never even thought to look at. And this massively complicates complicates a lot of plant diseases because there, there is a, 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 a key in there for allowing them to evolve strategies 
against our best efforts. And I think this is important not just for coffee, it's important for a wide range of pathogens. Why hasn't Africa benefited? Why can't the lessons learned in the Green Revolution in India and the Far East apply to Africa? I, we do think Agra, Kofi Annan, people like that, the Gateses, they do think it can be let, learned. So th there is increased mechanization. I would say, in rather blunt terms, it's because simply we have, as a community, as a world community, not focused enough energy on solving that. I, I think we, we have been uh, at loss there. I don't think there's something fundamentally wrong in the African psyche which can't allow them to adopt these uh, technologies. I think we failed. In the same way, when we invest more in, in, in curing baldness than malaria, we fail. Two questions about Pythoptera. Um, what is it? You said it is not a fungus, but it might as well be. What sort of organism is it? It's, it's a stromenopile, it's, it's an, it, it, or, or an umycete. It's a group, it's, it's a phyla, just like fungi or phyla. It's very, very far away, it's very distantly related. Fungi are more like animals than they are uh, like plants. For a long time, we classified them as plants, but if you look at them, the genetics, we realize that they're, the, the animals like us and fungi have more in common than we have it with plants. Um, by contrast, Phytophthora has much, much more common in plants because of where it sits on the evolutionary tree. So when I say it's very fungal-like, it grows like a fungus and it kicks out lots of chemicals. It's got something called osmotrophic growth. It grows in a long tube, kicks out lots of chemicals, and that's what kills it. So it's very successful in that way, just like the fungi are. And that's an example of convergent evolution, two distantly related organisms evolving exactly the same strategy. How can small community subsistence farmers um, near Penn State and also in Africa stay informed of plant diseases which might be emerging? It's amazing what's happening with the web now. So I was looking at the, uh, one of the Rockefeller sites the other day, and they will talk about some plan they're doing, some particular disease, and you have farmers in the middle of nowhere in Africa on forums, contributing, talking, through phones, maybe it's a smartphone that they have in one village, or maybe it's some other way. People like communicating. Go, uh, the mobile phone industry is a, one of the major industries in the entire world. This is the technology that we can use to inform diseases. So there's a plant clinics which are being uh, called plant pat clinics, which are being ro rolled out by Cabby in order to get that message out very quickly. If they can learn about David Beckham and the Kardashians, they can learn about disease. Are there any insects that might sustain a population as a food source directly? I think there are. In Southeast Asia, people have no qualms about eating insects. It's a major source of protein, uh, to some extent also in, in North Africa. Uh, we, we balk at this idea because we just don't like it. But there are many, many uh, viable sources of protein, not just eating the, the gruesome insects themselves, but just re reducing that to a sort of paste or a flour and it's a very important source of protein, so absolutely. Was the Irish potato used prior to the famine just one cultivar, one variety? Yes, yes, it was exactly the same bottleneck situation, yes. Is there a good bug to stop the emerald ash borer from destroying Pennsylvania's forests? There's a good fungus, uh, so we're, we're really leading the way. Uh, people like Nina Jenkins and, and uh, Kelly Hoover is doing a lot of viral work in entomology. So Penn State has a global prominence in using fungi. They have been nasty to us, but we can turn the tables and use them in classical biocontrol, just like the rust. And we're really developing this now for controlling the, the emerald ash borer by, by applications of fungi to kill them. To what extent does monoculture plant overpopulation contribute to the um, to diseases in crops? Enormously. I mean, the example from Fordlandia with the rubber trees is a great example of this. The 400,000 acres of uh, Sri Lanka planted with coffee, it's all a monoculture. It's all a perfect storm waiting for a disease to get in there and wipe through it. So what we have to have is intercropping, and we have to have diversity in there, genetic diversity and plant diversity. What are the catastrophes that ginger is causing in Hawaii? 
It's, 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 um, it's growing on, onto crops, which is one of the problems, but it's also growing onto the remnant forests which they have. And it's, um, it, like many, like in the Cryptostigia in Australia, it's sort of just blanketing them. So it doesn't let, uh, it doesn't let them photosynthesize, it doesn't let them grow properly. It smothers it. To what extent do you feel that the current drought situation in Russia, for example, will affect the sustainability of grain crops? So it affects it in two very important ways. One, it allows for evil investors to make money, just in, in the way that they have made money on, um, on um, uh, mortgage crisis here in America. They can invest in the rise and fall. We saw that in 2008. There's a very uh, important book called Food Politics which tells you that even though we had the massive rises in food prices because of droughts or because of reduced uh, outputs, uh, people just speculate upon it. It didn't really change the local food on the ground. So I think when you hear about uh, rainfall, some people can rub their hands with glee and say, here's an opportunity to make money. And I think we should uh, decouple uh, trade prices, commodities, commodities and, and very important crops like that. So that's one way. The other way is, uh, of course, just on the ground, it's going to affect yield. Many, many countries stockpile wheat. So whether it actually makes a big difference, um, it's, it's the question of whether there's a fear of a problem or an actual problem. In many cases, it's not a problem. It's just a fear and people benefiting from that fear in rather, rather nasty ways. What are the goals of the new research project that you described at the end of your talk that you've put together at Penn State? the eradication of ants in smallholder farms in Africa. There are many ants in these, in these locations. Naturally, in the tropical areas of Africa, there are three or 400 different species. From a cocoa farm, which is very good for biodiversity, there may be 125 or 175 different species. The vast majority are very good, and we like them, or they're just innocuous, they don't do any problems. Some of them, they don't belong there. They're invasive pests just as much as those uh, uh, plants which are all over the world. What we want to do is develop a range of technologies, pesticides, genetically modified plants, or biopesticides, and kill them in a way which has never been done before, which is to kill the queens, which are the central, essential feature of colonies. It's their Achilles heel. A colony may have hundreds of thousands of ants. Very difficult to control in terms of pesticide application. But if you kill the queen, the game is over. They can't just make another queen. And so what I want to do is, in small farms in Africa and elsewhere, change the landscape fundamentally in a way that suits us. We have changed the landscape fundamentally in lots of ways which are problematic for us. Why can't we use technology and science to do it in a way that's targeted and useful to small farmer holders? Thank you for your excellent talk, Dr. David Hughes. Thank you.